Welcome to the place where we gain knowledge through the lens of creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Artful Science. Thanks again for joining me here on Artful Science. Today's show is An Artful Planet, How the Arts Impact Climate Science. And my guest is Dr. Mika Tosca, who is a climate scientist, humanist, and an activist. She is an assistant professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and former affiliate climate researcher at JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. Mika, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to be here. Absolutely. So I am so excited. And I wanted to kind of also share that this show is co-curated with our wonderful thought partner, NASA, uh, who have been just fantastic in so many ways and inspiring for us at the show. Um, so you're a climate scientist. And, you know, astoundingly, there are still some uh, in our world who question climate change, its impact on humanity. So what I'm wondering, and I think this is just important, especially for kind of, you know, our a large arts audience, layperson audience, um, is there just some basic data that you can share with us so that we can kind of understand what is actually happening with climate and kind of, you know, are there any trends that we factually know here is what's happening with climate change? Yeah, of course. So, um, you know, before we, we started calling it climate change, we were calling it global warming. Um, and it's been back and forth actually a couple of times. And so the, so the, so the basic sort of data that I think everyone's probably seen, you know, whether it be in the media or maybe they've read a scientific paper or watched a video or a YouTube video. It sometimes is even in, you know, blockbuster movies when they show the scientists at the computer talking about climate change is that temperature record. So over the last 125 years, if you take all of the available sort of temperature data, station data or satellite data or whatever, on the planet and you average it all together, you get kind of an, an average global temperature. And if you look at that over the last 125 years, you see it going up about one degree Celsius. So the average temperature of the planet has, has risen since the late 1800s, about one degree Celsius. Now, there's a lot of you know skeptics, deniers, um, what have you, that will say, this is just a natural variation. This is what the climate does. Um, and so I'll just share a little bit about what, what actually led me to, um, to believe it. And I'll also point you to, um, there's a lot that's been written and there's actually a, a data set of temperature records that's compiled by a scientist at uh, Berkeley, Richard Miller, who um, was a skeptic initially and, and compiled the data and showed that the temperature was actually rising due to human impact. And what really convinced me personally um, was when I saw a side-by-side uh, from scientists at NASA, actually, uh, where I used to, to work full time, um, where they ran models, right? They ran these large climate models and they pulled different components out and how those different components would affect the global temperature, whether it be um, volcanoes, the sun, um, particulates that are emitted by humans, and then, of course, greenhouse gases, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, those sorts of things. And when you just isolate, for example, the natural variations in the climate, like volcanic activity, the sun's output, or um, particulates in the atmosphere, whether they're from deserts or from, from sea salt or what have you, you don't get a temperature record that looks like the one that we've observed. It's only when you put in the influence of human emissions that you get a temperature record like the one we've observed. So it's very convincing to me and to a lot of people um, that you don't get climate change, uh, you don't get the record of climate change that we've seen over the last, you know, 120 years if you don't include human influences. Um, something else, some other things that we've seen um, from, you know, data, looking back over the last 100 years, 1,000 years, what have you, um, is that since the end of the last ice age, we've been in a relatively stable, what we call interglacial period, 
um, where the temperature has been relatively constant, relatively stable. This is when all of you know human civilization arose, right? In the last ten thousand years. Um, before that, we were nomadic, and then you know we 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 we've become more agrarian, and we've stayed put, and we've evolved as as a as a society, as a as a globe of, full of humans during a relatively stable period um, of surface temperature. And it's only in the last you know, 120 years and really only in the last 50 years that we've seen that temperature rise dramatically. So we are definitely in an anomalous period that's being driven by um, emissions by, by, by human activity, greenhouse gas emissions. Wow. So, I mean, it's just extraordinary. And it seems that it's, it's obviously absolutely clear that, that we are actively participating in, the, in this change. And, um, and, and in a little bit, I kind of want to get to, so what does that mean? And what are we thinking we're going to experience you know, down the road? Um, but before that, in perfect alignment with our show, your work not only focuses on this climate science, but you actually focus on this synthesis between art and this science. So can you explain that to us? Like, what, what does that exactly mean? And, and how do the arts relate to this, you know, critically important climate science? Yeah, of course. So all of that data I was just talking about, um, it's relatively abstruse. It's relatively difficult for the, for the sort of average consumer that's not um, a scientist or that's not totally sort of immersed in the in the climate science world to kind of understand and wrap their head around you know I teach um, three courses at a university and my students always have a really difficult time kind of understanding what it means to see the temperature rising like what does that actually mean in my everyday life right if I say the temperature has risen um, one degree Celsius in the last 120 years, um, the average person wakes up and the temperature goes up 20 degrees in a day, right? So they, they're not quite under, able to understand what that means in a practical sense. And so I think this is a failure of the science community, of the communication of science, um, and, 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 and the ability of the public, the general public, to kind of understand these difficult concepts. And so we have been working in the science community for a long time to figure out how to best communicate these things, how to best talk about climate change so that uh, folks not only understand it, but are compelled to kind of act on it. And the way that I've kind of been approaching this is through the arts, right? So um, I often, I, I just recently published a, a manuscript um, and the first paragraph um, I actually quoted, this is crazy, in a scientific paper, I quoted Octavia Butler, who um, writes a lot of Afrofuturism. And while there's not, you know, a direct parallel to sort of what I'm talking about, what, what she actually does, right, is she imagines future worlds, often post-apocalyptic, post-environmental apocalyptic worlds, and she imagines them, um, you know, in these societies and they exist in, in different ways and, and, and all of this. And I think what art can really do really well is capture the human imagination. Um, and I often say to my students, if we can imagine it, then we can build it. If we can imagine the world that we want, then we can build the world that we want. And who better to help us imagine the world that we want than art and artists and designers and makers, right? So I think that there's really an important role for art in, in kind of sparking the human imagination. I often cite um, a, a well-known uh, philosopher, Timothy Morton, who wrote a book called Hyper Objects. Um, and in it, he talks about climate change as being a hyper object, um, an object that's so large, temporally, spatially, it's so vast, it has all these different moving parts that it's difficult for the human brain to understand what it is, where it is, why it is, all of that, right? And so to help us kind of untangle these abstract concepts and these abstract objects, who better than artists that deal in kind of visual and sonic abstractions all of the time, right? To help us kind of imagine and think about really complicated and abstruse data and concepts in ways that our brain is really like adapted to do. Which is so, so important. And I think that's just so critical. And also, of course, what we try and do um, here as well. So I think that's phenomenal. And especially the illustration, so we can visualize, just kind of an average person can visualize these, these concepts. So, you know, kind of moving forward and for people who say, ah, okay, you know, and it's one degree and so on and so forth. Where do you, do you think these things are, are long horizon things or where do you think things will be say in like about 50 years 
as it relates to climate and then this role that we could potentially have still for art to help us visualize it? Yeah, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I just turned 37 a couple of days ago, so I wouldn't say that I'm old, but I'm definitely getting older. And when I started grad school, I was, you know, 21, it was 2006. And we were still at that time talking about climate change as though it was some future, future, you know, thing that was going to happen. Um, but, you know, fast forward or, or slow forward 15 years or so, and here we are, we've got another hurricane that's slammed into New Orleans. We've got fires again raging in California, right? We've got, we've got heat waves, we've got flooding. Um, and these things, it's not in your, to use that word again, imagination, that disasters are in the news more. There really are more of them. It's really um, increasing. Extreme weather events really are increasing. So I actually think climate change kind of is, is here. Um, it's at the beginning sort of stages of what, you know, when I was in grad school, we were learning, we we're talking about the future, we would often talk about, you know, the middle of the century, what was going to happen? Well, in a couple of months, it's going to be 2022. We're halfway there, right? We're halfway to the middle of the century. So um, <clears throat> I think that, you know, climate change is kind of here. So if I think forward 50 years, um, it makes me both nervous and optimistic. Um, and I'll explain why. I think, you know, I think we are, we are likely to see uh, continuing, you know, impacts of climate change. I think things are going to get a lot worse. But I also tell my students that we really live in this kind of revolutionary opportunity and this revolutionary time where we can we can construct the future, and there is still time to construct that future. And we kind of have this incredible opportunity as global citizens, um, as scientists, as artists, as makers, as whomever, to construct that future. And we do still have time to do that. And I and I think that people are kind of starting to, to, to realize or, or, or climb on board, if you will, get on the bandwagon, that change needs to happen, that we've got to do this now, that we have to radically kind of transform our society, the way we, we go about our lives and the way we you know, consume energy and, and other things to create this future that, that we want. So I'm both optimistic and I'm also a little bit scared. <laughs> um, and if I think about art, I think that really, even just in the, in the last decade, um, I came to teach at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 2017 after working for, for several years at um, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. And uh, at the time I was like, wow, this is kind of a really big career move. I'm going from you know, this scientific institution, this stalwart of like kind of Cold War science, if you will, to an art school. And everyone was like, that's, that's weird and wacky and whatever. But in my time there and in exploring the ways that art and science can intersect, um, I've noticed that the field has also moved in that direction, right? There, there are more grants available now if you're looking to combine the two. There are a lot of people thinking about how art design and science can combine to kind of create this, um, this, this you know, new way of, of knowledge making, this new way of producing knowledge, yeah. So I'm, I'm optimistic that art will continue to play a role and that we can, we, can, we can solve this thing, solve this crisis. Awesome, awesome. So unfortunately, we're just about out of time, but I always like to ask my guests is, you know, that you're of course kind of seeped at this wonderful cross section, but do you have a specific kind of arts discipline that you like practicing yourself or that you just like appreciating? Absolutely. So um, as a kid, I was I was definitely, um, you know, artistically inclined. I wouldn't say I was good at art, but I loved drawing and I loved imagining things and all that. And and as I've gotten older and, and, and you know, I'm a queer person and I enjoy um, different aspects of queer culture. And one of those is, is electronic music or techno music or house music. And I've done a lot of work with with students and other um techno producers and musical producers and thinking about the ways that techno is both a political, um, you know, and it's like a political entity and an entertainment sort of thing, right? It has, has deep roots in queer and black and brown communities. And I think that it can also be a political force for, for climate change. And so I'm a, I'm a big appreciative, a, a big aficionado, if you will, of, of techno music and house music, electronic music. And I think there's a role for that course in solving the climate crisis. So cool, so awesome. And you know, uh, emanating from Detroit, we're all about, uh, we're all about music for sure. Uh, well, Mika Tosca, thank you 
for helping us gain knowledge through the lens of creativity here on Artful Science. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.